All right, Job chapter 3. It begins, After this Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth, and Job said, Let the day perish on which I was born, and the night that said a man is conceived, let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep, dark, deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the night terrify it that night. Let thick darkness seize it. Let, let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Well, obviously, first of all, Job is miserable. He's in pain. And he is giving a very extended discourse along the lines of, I wish I'd never been born. So in that sense, it's just an outburst of a person who's in deep pain. But of course, there is much more to it than him just saying, I wish I'd never been born. We've already talked about this phenomenon of the undoing of creation. So let's look at it in detail and see the points at which Job wants to see creation undone and the parallels in Genesis. In the verses I just read, in verses 3 to 6, he speaks of the day perishing along with the night, of the day becoming darkness with no light in it, overwhelmed with darkness and gloom and blackness, and the night itself being seized by darkness. So he uses repeatedly the language of light and darkness which a number of people have observed is a reversal of the first day of creation Genesis chapter 1 verses 3 and 4 and God said let there be light and there was light there was light God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness God called the light day and the darkness he called night and there was evening there was morning the first day Notice what we have here. We have the creation of light, the separation of light and darkness, the use of the terms light, darkness, day and night several times. And in Job, we have repeated reference to day and night, to light and darkness, only it is always that it should be undone, that everything should revert to darkness. So the first thing he wants to undo is the light the creation of light. Second, he wishes to obliterate his birthday from the calendar. In verse 6b, he says, uh, let it not, uh, let that, that night, the night of his birth, the day of his birth, let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. So notice he speaks of the days of the year, the numbers of the month. In other words, the breaking up of uh, days or the grouping of days into years, into different seasons, to a calendar in effect, which is apparently an undoing of the making of the seasons. Genesis 1.14 uh, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heaven to separate the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and for years. So the days are grouped according to the heavenly bodies into years. Phases of the moon make months. And the cycles of, uh, of the seasons make years. So you have the creation of the seasons, the creation of the calendar of organized time. And Job calls for his birthday to be removed from that. And so, at least in terms of his birthday, he is undoing the whole calendar. Thirdly, Job speaks of those who arouse or invoke Leviathan. Verse 8, let those who curse it curse the day. 
Let those who curse it curse the day. I'm sorry. Let those who let those curse it who curse the day, who are ready to rouse up Leviathan. So he speaks of rousing up, which in this case means to invoke, to call upon Leviathan. Now, this is referenced basically to what we would call black magic. This is people doing some type of a magical ritual using magical spells, magical words, some kind of, of um, you know, dark arts to invoke Leviathan, who is here understood to be some kind of a great demonic figure in order to bring about destruction. When you compare that to what God does in Genesis 1, what do we read? Uh, Genesis 1.20, God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let birds fly above the heavens, across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So what you have in Genesis 1 is God speaks and birds and sea creatures, including the great sea creatures, uh, such as whales, are made, are created. Job speaks of those who you, through magical formulas, invoke Leviathan, who, as it were, call up Leviathan by their speech. He wants this because he wants this super powerful demon this monster, Leviathan, to devour and destroy the day of his birth. So this is a very, very powerful kind of invocation. But what I'm especially wanting to focus on here is the reversal. God, by his speech, calls up all the creatures of the earth and calls them good. The dark magicians, by their speech, invoke and arouse Leviathan. Next, four, Job wishes that he had died in the, in the womb and he curses every aspect of his birth. Verse 11, why did I not die at birth, come out from the womb and expire? Why did the knees receive me or why the breast that I should nurse? In verse 16, or why was I not as a hidden stillborn child, as infants who never see the light? Now, of course, what Job is referring to is his own birth, but in terms of the universal scope of Genesis, he speaks of procreation, the reproduction of the human species through birth. And what do we read back in Genesis 1? Again, Genesis 1, 28. Speaking of humanity, God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and have some, uh, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heaven, every living thing that moves on the earth. But the main thing I'm wanting to point out here is God calls upon humans to give birth to have babies, to have children, whereas for Job, he curses his own birth. So we could just think of this as the birth process. Fifth, Job desires rest but it is the rest of death and the tomb. Job chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. For then I would have lain down and been quiet. I would have slept and have lain at rest with kings and counselors of the earth who rebuilt ruins for themselves or with princes who had gold who filled their houses with silver. So in other words, he's talking about the grave where all the powerful and the rich who have died 
now lie in their tombs. Verse 17, the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest. There the prisoners are at ease together. They hear not the voice of the taskmaster. The small and the great are there. The slave is free from his master. So here again, he speaks of Sheol. He speaks of the grave, the tomb. And he speaks of it as a place of rest and repose. The great and the small are there. The wicked and the good are there. The insignificant and the powerful are there. The prisoners are there. The slaves and the masters are there. They're all dead. They're all at repose. And so his concept of rest at this point is death. And I would suggest that this contrast with the seventh day in Genesis. Genesis chapter 2 verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God finished from his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. In other words, this is kind of, well this is obviously, this is Sabbath. This is the idea not of being dead, but of enjoying the work of God. Being at rest with the work that God has done. And ultimately, of course, it has an eschatological sense of God's rest, entering God's rest. But the only rest that Job can speak of at this point is death. So what we have here is a portrait of um, the creation narrative being stood on its head. Now it stood on its head in a very individual sense, of course, because Job is speaking of the day of his birth. Job is not of sufficient stature to curse all of creation, but in cursing the day of his birth for himself, he curses all of creation. In other words, from his perspective, creation is something he wants to nullify. It's like, as far as I'm concerned, creation wasn't worth the effort. I want to opt out. So it is a really radical statement of um, not just Job saying, I'm in pain, I wish I'd never been born, but of Job really saying, for me, creation has become a bad thing. A waste of time. As I said, something I'd like to opt out of. Now, why is that significant? It's significant because creation sets up the order of God. Remember, creation is the foundation of wisdom literature. When God made the world, he embedded wisdom into creation. Lady Wisdom was there with him at the creation. Job is really, in effect, saying, you know, it, to me it doesn't look that way. I don't see a well-ordered creation where everything is proceeding beautifully. I see a, a creation of chaos where you have, and he already alludes to it here, slave and free, rich and poor, oppressor and oppressed, and so Job is on the most fundamentally, fundamental level saying, we got to question whether this wisdom is really in creation at all. Whether there is any real goodness that governs the world. So Job is saying, in effect, as far as I can see, from what has happened to me, there is no r rationality, no righteous governing principle behind creation. He is, in fact, questioning the whole wisdom premise. 
So if you wondered, and we'll get to Eliphaz in a moment, if you wondered, why is Eliphaz so upset immediately? As soon as he hears these words, he starts saying, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, Job. Whoa, whoa, back up. He knows what Job is saying. That Job is questioning the very presence of wisdom in creation, if you will, the very goodness of creation. And so for him, that's very upsetting. Look at chapter 3, verse 25, the end of Job's speech. For the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. So he says the thing he has feared has come upon him. Well, what is that? Was Job constantly afraid of poverty? Was Job constantly afraid, you know, something could happen to his kids? Well, in a sense, yeah, the text does tell us he was very concerned about his kids and offered these sacrifices for him. But I don't think that's enough. The thing I think that Job really feared is it would all be vain. His commitment to righteousness uh, would turn out to be hollow. And as far as he's concerned, that's come true. You can serve God, you can fear God, you can shun evil, and yet all of these terrible things happen to you. Now, once again, I have to remind you of two things we're stressing here. First, the premise, Job is righteous. Just a moment. If you get away from saying that Job is righteous and you start attributing sin to him as the, the, the cause of his troubles, you're, you, you've completely distorted the book. Um, once again, I've forgotten the second thing. Job is righteous. Oh, and, um, well, no, that was my basic premise. Well, we'll just go with that for now. <laughs> Remember that, that essentially you have to stick with the premise that Job is righteous. Oh, my, I remember now, I remember now. <laughs> it is the fact uh, that Job begins with the same presuppositions as the three. Why is he so angry? Why is he so bitter? Why do his words come out so harsh? Because he believes what the three believe. He believes that God rewards the righteous and punishes the evil. And he sees it's not true. And that's what makes him so upset. That's what makes him so angry. So again, unless you hold to the premise that he is righteous... You can't understand why he's so upset that, the, that his presupposition, that his, the core faith that he holds to has failed. So that's why he curses the day of his birth. So over here, yes. How can we keep saying that he's a righteous man when he wants to do God's work? I think we need to understand it in two ways. He is a righteous man in, in the, 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 the proof of his righteousness or the reality of his righteousness is in two basic areas. Area one is he will not curse God. He'll say, I want to undo creation. He'll say, I see evil triumphant everywhere. I see all these terrible things, but he doesn't ever curse God. The other thing is, as he gives in his confession at the end of the book, in, or at the end of his speeches, in um, chapter 31, is um, he will list all of the major categories of sin that one might accuse him of, and he will deny that he's committed any of those sins. And again, we're to understand his denial is correct. He didn't commit any of those sins. So in the most fundamental area, he doesn't curse God. And in terms of all the basic sins he could have committed, he didn't commit any of them. So, you know, in all that sense, he's righteous. Now, 
We have to jump ahead to, to answer your question fully, we have to jump ahead briefly to the God's speech. God, first of all, never accuses Job of sin. He never says in his speech, you know, Job, actually, I'm aware of this sin you committed and that sin you committed. You read through all of God's speech. He never accuses Job of sin. He does, however, accuse Job or tell Job he's come to some wrong conclusions. And so Job is, how can I, I, I think the best way to explain, you know, what you're expressing is something pious readers have struggled with in Job ever since people started reading it. How can someone talk this way and be an epitome of righteousness? I would say, look at the Psalms. When you read the Psalms, you have all these prayers that, from our standpoint, are astonishingly blunt with God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God, we call on you, but you don't listen. You turn away. You've turned a deaf ear. Have you forgotten us, God? Have you abandoned your covenant? Have you abandoned your people? When you read the prayers of the Psalms, they can be astonishingly direct. But they are not for that reason regarded as sinful or even impious. They are, they are bold, honest statement to God of what I'm experiencing and calling on God for help. And that is uh, ultimately, I think, what Job is doing. He is looking at his situation. He's saying, based on everything I know, again, presupposition, God punishes the wicked, God rewards the righteous. Premise, Job is righteous. Based on everything I know, it's not true. And so all of the cursing or, or calling down the, the uh, destruction of the day of his birth and all that, that's a way just of saying, God, as far as I can tell, it's not true. So he's just really being very blunt with God, maybe more blunt than many of us feel we can be in our prayers, but his prayers are not unique in that regard. Even the psalmist David will do that frequently. Okay? Yes? Uh, you've been uh, teaching that in, uh, in Job chapter 3, there are a lot of allusions to creation. Right. And that Job is kind of uh, undoing creation bit by bit by bit mm -hmm. to explain, to understand his uh, situation. My question is, uh, does Job know about the fall? Is there anything in Job where there are allusions to the, the fall? There is no allusion that I can tell, can see, to the story of Adam and Eve and the fall in the book of Job. However, Knowledge of sin and uh, even is so common, is so prevalent in Job. I mean, it just dominates the book. So you cannot say they are unaware of the, the idea of the universality of sin. So no, to answer your question, there is no reference to the fall, uh, as far as I can tell. But there, there is, on every page, virtually, uh, until you get, strangely, to God's speech, there is constant reference to sin as a phenomenon that is universal, that is everywhere. As I say, it's quite striking. This is another, I began by saying you have to take Job on its own terms. Who would you most expect to talk about sin? God. Who, on all the speeches, doesn't talk about sin? God. Is quite striking. <clears throat> Go ahead. One of the articles we read talked about how in here there's possibly allusion to some non biblical incantation in magical text. And we talked a little bit about that today too, some similarities to mm -hmm. the ancient text. <clears throat> right. So, yeah, Fishbane's article, right? right? He talks about that. So, what would be the, where, would, where would Job have gotten that from? And, and what would be the benefit to the well, I mean, I think there's a couple aspects to that. First of all, I don't necessarily accept everything Fishbane says about what he sees as allusions to 
magical text. Some of it I think is valid, I, others I'm not totally sure of. So I don't want to come across as endorsing everything Fishbane says because I don't. However, the in, the, speaking of those who invoke Leviathan clearly is a kind of black magic sort of reference. And that's something, there wouldn't be a Hebrew alive who didn't know about that. I mean, it was everywhere around them. Uh, it was certainly in all pagan culture, and it would, you know, I mean, from what you read in the prophets, it had pretty thoroughly influenced or, or infiltrated Israelite literature. So basically what Job, he is calling upon, you know, he's saying in the most powerful possible way, I want to see the day of my birth swallowed up. So in terms of Job's speech, I think that's all we should do with it. You know, it's just, it's a very, very emphatic way of making his point. But clearly he was aware, and any reader of Job would have been very aware of, of uh, you know, those who, who uh, invoke dark forces for magical purposes. <coughs> it, was, it was common. Okay. So basically what we see here is uh, in Job's opening speech is his notion that the moral order has been obliterated. And so for that reason he says, as far as I'm concerned, creation is not the moral order that we thought it was. Thus ends Job's first speech. We now come to the speech of Eliphaz. Now I, I'm going to approach this in a little bit of a distinctive way from this point forward in the lectures. I am not going to sequentially work through every chapter. I'm going to work through groups of chapters and at various points I will back up. That is to say there will be some concepts I will only touch upon the first time through but then I will come and I will deal with them in more detail later. So I want you to understand from this point forward we're not just going to sequentially work through the book, we're going to work through various issues in the book. <laughs> And the first issue I want us to deal with is the moral decay of the three. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Basically what I want to contend to you is that the speeches of the three have two purposes. First, they are the voice piece for orthodox wisdom. They are the ones who give all the arguments in favor of the traditional view the uh, doctrine of cosmic justice. They put forward all the arguments they can. And they're not straw men. Their arguments are strong. And when you read them, you find them appealing. And much of what they say, in fact, is true. Uh, ultimately, their arguments will be wrong. But that doesn't mean everything they say is wrong. So first, they are voice pieces for traditional wisdom. The second thing they are, they are an example. Because as I indicated already, you see in them a spiritual decay. When you go from the beginning of Eliphaz's speech to the end of his speech and the, the very end with the speech of Bildad, the last speech of Bildad in chapter 25, you see them ha having come down. I can't think the way we can best communicate it, they end up as Pharisees. The Pharisees who voted to execute Jesus. The Pharisees and the chief priests. That's where they end up. With a hollow self-righteousness and a hateful, bitter spirit. So, let's begin with Eliphaz's speech. Verse chapter 4, Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, If one ventures a word with you, will you be impatient? Yet who can keep from speaking? Behold, you've instructed many. You've strengthened the weak hands. Your words have upheld whom who was, him who was stumbling. You have made firm the feeble knees. But now it has come to you, and you are impatient. It touches you, and you are dismayed. Is not your fear of God your confidence? and the integrity of your ways, your hope. Well, characterize for me that opening to Eliphaz's speech. What is the tone he uses? 
Gracious. Gracious. Tactful. Subtle. Respectful. Subtle. He begins by saying, you know, my goodness, Job. You know, you, you've been a great teacher to many. You've helped people. You've instruct them, instructed them. When people have gone into error, you've corrected them. So now you're having some trouble. And there are things that are vexing you. I wonder if I might just get a word in here. So he's extremely tactful. And I don't think we should look upon this as, uh, I don't know, deceitful or something. I think he is at this point genuinely patient with Job. He thinks, you know, if I can just correct Job, just point out to him, you know, you're being inconsistent with your former life here. If I can just give him a little correction, he'll be okay. So, verse 5, he says, It has come to you, you're impatient, it touches you, you're dismayed. Is not your fear of God your confidence, and the integrity of your ways your hope? Verse 7 is a key verse. Remember, who that was innocent has ever perished? Or where were the upright cut off? As I have seen, those who plow iniquity and so trouble reap the same. By the breath of God they perish, by the blast of his anger they are consumed. The roar of the lion, the voice of the fierce lion, the teeth of the young lion are broken. The strong lion perishes for lack of prey, and the cubs of the lioness are scattered. What does Eliphaz say in verses 7 to 11? What is the very essence of his argument? God punishes the wicked. God rewards the righteous. If this is happening to you, you have sinned. His basic idea is simply retribution. That's the core doctrine. Notice the metaphor he uses, verses 10 and 11. The metaphor of the roaring of the lion. Let me remind you of something here. Going back into what we did yesterday. Here we go. The Babylonian theodicy. The sufferer says the savage lion that devoured the choicest meat. Did it bring its offerings to appraise the goddess? So in other words, a wicked person is characterized as a savage lion. Whereas in the answer, the friend says the Lord, the, that God will punish the lion and will commit, it to, commit him to the flames. Eliphaz uses the same metaphor. He speaks of the wicked as the lion. And God is going to break his teeth. So what I'm saying here is it looks like when you read verses 7 to 11, it looks like Eliphaz is just kind of giving, I don't know, little pious aphorisms saying, you know, God punishes the wicked, God is just, all this sort of thing. But that's not it. I mean, that's true, but there's more to it than that. God is saying to Job, this is the, I'm sorry, Eliphaz is saying to Job, this is the answer. The basic solution is retribution for sin. If you are suffering, you have sinned. The next thing we come to is the arrival of the Spirit. Verse 12, where he says, A word was brought to me stealthily. I don't want to consider this part of the text at this point. We're going to consider this separately. So what we have here is just, Eliphaz gets a visit from a spirit and he relates the message and he considers the spirit to be supporting him in his argument uh, that humans are sinful and that God is punishing them for their sin. And so we'll just take it at that at this point. But when we, um, when we look at this later, we're going to give a lot of attention to the message of the spirit and what it all signifies. 
So we come to chapter 5. Call now, is there anyone who will answer to which of the holy ones will you turn? Surely vexation kills the fool and jealousy slays the simple. So there we have a proverb. Again, Eliphaz at this point is, is not speaking directly, but he's speaking in a way that Job understands. This is just a little proverb. Vexation kills the fool. But in context, what is it? Who is vexed in this passage? Job is. And Eliphaz is calling Job a fool. And he doesn't mean that as just, you know, an insult. It's a fool in the context of wisdom literature. What do you have in Proverbs? You have the contrast between the wise and the fool. The fool is the man who, re who rejects the teachings of wisdom. He rejects lady wisdom. He falls into destruction because of it. So when Eliphaz says this, he says, Job, you are one of those who has rejected wisdom and you are being destroyed because of it. And then he goes on and he talks about the fool at length. I've seen the fool taking root. Suddenly, I cursed his dwelling. His children are far from safety. They are crushed in the gate. There is none to deliver him. Now, again... When you read it, it sounds like, you know, this is just wise testimony about the fate of the wicked. But what has just happened in the story? Job's lost everything. He's lost everything. And specifically, what has he lost? His children. A storm came, a whirlwind, and killed his children. What does Eliphaz say? His children are far from safety. They are crushed in the gate. So this is a straightforward statement that Job, you have suffered because you're a wicked man. You did something wicked. We don't know what it is, but we know that you had to have done it. Verse 5, the hungry eat his harvest he takes it even out of thorns, the thirsty pant after his wealth. He speaks of the hungry and the thirsty taking his wealth, taking his food. What has just happened to Job? We well, had the Sabaeans and the, um, the Chaldeans come charging through, take away all of his sheep and all of his cattle, all of his possessions. So again, behind these apparently just truisms are really severe accusations of Job. In verse 8, what does he do? He calls upon Job to repent. Chapter 5, verse 8. As for me, I would seek God, and to God I would commit my cause, who does great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. He gives rain on the earth, sends waters to the fields. And then he gives, you know, this, this high praise of the nature of God. He frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands achieve no success. He catches the wise in their craftiness. And he goes on and he gives this lengthy account of how the wicked suffer. Verse 17 Blessed is the one whom God reproves. Therefore, despise not the discipline of the Almighty. Well, that's certainly true, isn't it? There's nothing wrong at this point with what Eliphaz is saying. Verse 8, to seek God is good. To be disciplined by God is good. We should not despise God's discipline. That's what Hebrews teaches, right? So everything he says at this point is good. So, you know, anticipating, knowing as we do that Eliphaz will be condemned by God, what is wrong here? What's wrong with what Eliphaz is saying when his words are so quotable and so true at this point and so good? Yeah, I mean, basically, it can something can be true, but be inappropriate, out of context, not the right answer 
to the question. Well, yeah, judging it, yeah, in the sense of uh, accusing him of being a sinner. No doubt about it. <clears throat> Let's move on to Bildad's speech. Chapter 8, Bildad. Then Bildad the Shuhite answered and said, For how long will you say these things, and the words of your mouth be a great wind? Does God pervert justice, or does the Almighty pervert right? Let's pause right there. That question, what is the answer to that question? Does God pervert justice? No, he does not. God does not pervert justice. So we can be sure that God has done nothing unjust. Again, what I'm trying to get across is we can have a true idea, a theological idea that is correct, but we can draw completely wrong conclusions from it. Again, Bildad at this point is applying the doctrine of cosmic justice. He says, God never makes a mistake. If you're suffering, it's because you sinned. After all, God does that, never does something unjust, right? So it can sound very plausible. An argument can sound, can be based in orthodox true teaching and yet its conclusion be wrong. He then gives a series of conditional questions, if questions. Verse 4. If your children sinned against him, he has delivered them into the hand of their transgression. If you will seek God and plead with the Almighty for mercy, if you are pure and upright, surely then he will rouse himself for you and restore your rightful habitation. And though your beginning was small, your latter days will be very great. Now what's the significance of these if questions? They're indirect. He doesn't say, your children did sin. And that's why they all died. He says, if you, or he doesn't say, if you were pure and upright, then God would be, I'm sorry, he doesn't say, because you are impure and not upright, God has punished you. But the if questions have the rhetorical effect of saying, if you think about it, you'll understand that there's only one logical conclusion. You can't come to any other reasonable conclusion. In verses 8 to 10, we read, For inquire, please, of bygone ages, and search out what the fathers have, and consider what the fathers have searched out. For we are but of yesterday and know nothing. For our days on earth are a shadow. Will they not teach you? and tell you and utter words out of their understanding. So he appeals to the wisdom of the ancients. What is the significance of this? The significance is to set up this whole body of orthodox wisdom, traditional wisdom, and saying, look, it's all set against you. Everything you are claiming is wrong. If what you are saying is true, then the whole body of received wisdom, all the teaching we've had handed down to us through the generations has turned out to be false. And so he is basically, um, again, doing exactly what Job has done. He has set Job's experience over against the whole body of, of wisdom. And he's saying, Obviously, you're not right. They must be right. And therefore, again, you're a sinner. He then moves into a series of metaphors. Verses 11 and following. Can papyrus grow where there's no marsh? Can reeds flourish where there's no water? While yet in flower and not cut down, they wither before any plant. Such are the paths of those who forget God. The hope of the godless shall perish. 
His confidence is severed. His trust is like a spider's web. Um, notice here he uses the metaphor of the plant. Verse 11. Now, this is a familiar metaphor from the Bible. Uh, we see it most famously in Psalm 1. That the righteous man is like a tree that is planted uh, by canals of water. And it flourishes in season and out, in, out of season. It always bears fruit. Whereas the wicked are like the chaff that the wind drives away. So this metaphor of the plant for the righteous versus the wicked is a standard common metaphor. Here the metaphor is of papyrus and reeds where there is no water. So a papyrus is of course a plant that is utterly dependent upon water. It can't last at all without water. It can't survive for even a short time without water. And he's saying the wicked in the same way are thoroughly struck down uh, and all that they trust in collapses very suddenly. He then uses the illustration of the spider's web and in verse 15 compares it to a house which suddenly collapses. Just as you can sweep away a spider's web, so a man's house will suddenly collapse. And his point, once again, is Job, this is you. You are like a papyrus out of water. Your house has, in this case, literally collapsed. Remember the storm, the whirlwind. So behind all these metaphors are accusations of Job. It is important for us to notice, by the way, that the friends always argue from effect to cause. They see the effect that Job is suffering. They therefore assume that the Explanation must be guilt. So they work backwards in that way. We then come to the first speech of Zophar, which is chapter 11. And Zophar displays real anger at Job. Uh, Eliphaz at least began with a very patient tone and he maintained a patient to tone in the first speech. Bildad, maybe a little more direct, but still fairly indirect. Zophar, at this point, is ready to more directly accuse God. I'm going to accuse Job, I'm sorry. Verse 2, shall a multitude of words go unanswered and a man be full of talk and yet be judged right? Should your babble silence men when you mock? Shall no one shame you? For you say, my doctrine is pure. I am clean in God's eyes. So first of all, just notice the tone. He speaks of Job as babbling. In fact, Job hasn't said all that much yet, but um, he is accusing Job of speaking nonsense at length. He says, you say, my doctrine is pure, I am clean in God's eyes. Now there's clear irony there from the standpoint of the narrator. You say, I am clean in God's eyes. What did God say about Job? Have you considered my servant Job, a man who is pure and upright, who fears God and turns away from evil? In fact, he is clean in God's eyes. And the irony continues at verse 5. Oh, that God would speak and open his lips to you, and that he would tell you the secrets of wisdom. For he is manifold in understanding. Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. Now there's two things here. First, what is the irony in verses, verses 5 and the beginning of verse 6? God will, eventually God will speak to him. God will reveal wisdom to Job. God will uh, show some of his deep understanding. But the other side of that is how will it end up? 
God will turn to Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar and say, you have not spoken rightly of me as my servant Job has. So Zophar correctly predicts that God will speak to Job, but it will turn out to be the opposite of what Zophar expects. Notice also, though, that Zophar here has bluntly, uh, in an unvarnished way, accused Job of being a great sinner. God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. Job, as far as I'm concerned, you're just a wicked, wicked man. And if God punished you as you deserved, you'd be suffering much more than you are right now. So as I say, Zophar is the first one to show real anger and bitterness uh, towards Job. Verse 7 is interesting. Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? It is higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol. What can you know? Its measures longer than the earth and broader than the sea. If he passes through and imprisons and summons the court, who can turn him back? Now, what I want you to think about for a moment is what he says in verses 8 and 9. God's wisdom, God's ways are higher than heaven, deeper than Sheol, longer than the earth, broader than the sea. What's that kind of sound like? It does sound like God says. God will say some very similar things. But also, Ephesians. Let's see if I have it here. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18. Start at verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth of and length, and height, and depth. To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, and be filled with all the fullness of God. The metaphor, the language of speaking of the breadth, and height, and depth, and length of God, and his ways, is a standard biblical use of language. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing bad about it. But it is being used by Zophar in a very negative way. He's basically saying, God is so wise, so deep, so great, that he can find every sin you've committed and punish them all. In fact, in the book of Job, the answer is, God is so great, so deep, so wide, so vast, that he's doing things you don't begin to understand. And in Paul, of course, the depth and breadth and length and height of God describes his love and his compassion on those who uh, in Christ. But again, Zophar is using orthodox language, standard biblical language, for something that is actually uh, very dark. So in verse 13 and following, he calls upon Job to repent. If you prepare your heart, stretch out your hands toward him. If iniquity is in your hand, put it far away. Let not injustice dwell in your tents. Surely you will lift your face without blemish. You will be secure, not fear. You will forget your misery. You will remember it as waters that have passed away. Your life will be brighter than the noonday. Darkness will be like the morning. And you'll feel secure because there's hope. You'll look around, take your rest in security, etc. So what does he call on Job to do here? He calls on Job to repent. He says, Job, you've sinned. If you will just confess your sin, everything will be fine. So he is appealing to Job just to confess sin. And it'll be all right. His wife had told him, curse God and die. Now, Job is being tempted to do something that is wrong. Because he doesn't, there's, there's nothing for him to repent of. Again, you have to accept the premise of the book to make sense of it. As a general rule, this advice is great. 
This is another case where you can look at Zophar and you can say, well, that'll preach. As it applies to all of us, as it applies to humanity generally, this is a wonderful text. But in the case of Job, it is inappropriate. In terms of its broader application, it should make us again understand that we should not attribute all suffering to personal guilt.